It's got weird things on it. I can't even read that label. <laughs> okay. Next, let's bring it down. Let's bring it down a little bit. That is not what I thought it was. <laughs> oh, great! That is not what I thought it was. <laughs> I have no help for you. <laughs> I have nothing to add. Oh, here. my gosh. <laughs> you know what we need to figure out is punishments if we can't get it. Right? Oh, yeah, like shots or something. Yeah. <laughs> Now we're talking. <laughs> like you get three clues. Uh, like beer pong. If you don't get it, it's either a shot or like a paintball gun to the face or something. <laughs> something easy. Yeah. Welcome back to In the Isles presented by O'Reilly Auto Parts. I'm your host, Derek Beery from Vice Grip Garage. And today I've got a very special guest. I know you've seen him on TV for years. He's an instructor, he's a painter, he's a builder. Mr. Kevin Tetz, how's it going? Good. Good to see you, thanks for coming out. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me, man, this yeah. is fun. So you've been out here a time or two, I've been to your shop a time or two. Yep. And it just seemed like we should just sit down and chew on the fat like we normally do and let people in on the conversation. There's never time to do that. You are a run and gun guy and you are constantly moving and I'm kind of the same way and that's that self-employed disease that we have. And it's just, really unusual and uncommon that we both have the time to sit and chat. So it's kind of fun, so thanks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of on a whim. I called yesterday, I was like, well, it's a shot in the dark, because like you were just saying, we're both yeah. doing this. We're yeah. on either yeah, side of the country. coming back from Georgia, yeah. back to Tennessee. And, yeah. 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 It's like, well, if you could be in Tennessee tomorrow, I'll be in Tennessee tomorrow, maybe we could do this. And yeah. It just yeah. happened to work. So that's awesome. So. For those that are not, if they're under a rock, familiar with your <laughs> history and past, obviously you've, you've been an innovator and a creator and a builder, like I'm saying. I've watched you on TV for years. I've, uh, I've watched some of your videos on painting and setting up guns and all this stuff. What's kind of your history? Where did you come from? And where are you sitting today? <sighs> okay, so 30,000 foot view. I grew up around cars. You know, that was the language that we had. We talked about, we loved cars. You know, there's certain things. Um, music gets you that gut feel. When you hear a song, there's a group or, a, or something. Cars are like that for me right. as well. And you know, you a know, when you see it, yeah. whatever it is, man, it's this magnetic thing. It's this visceral emotional reaction. And it's, it's from the experience growing up and these cars and, and you know, we were of a certain age and, and Shelby and you know, Ferrari, all, it, it meant something and those, those were special things. So there were things that we shared as kids and, and uh, you know, it, so those are our touchstones for me in, in my formative years trying to figure out who I was and all that type of stuff. It all came back to cars. And, you know, we grew up with nothing. We grew up with, with no money. And when I wanted a car, I had to build a car. Mm -hmm. And didn't do it very well. <laughs> you, know, you know, I had junk in the driveway and, and it was a gravel driveway. I'll never forget it. The first vehicle I ever had was a, a, a 49 GMC truck, inline six. And, and you know, you just kind of, I don't, I don't know where it comes from. You have it too. But when you're faced with something that's so overwhelming, that you can't possibly get it all done. You do something small mm -hmm. and you get a win. Yeah. So I remember sanding and painting the glove box door yep. and this truck yep. with rattle can paint and it looked like crap and then I did it again and then it looked okay and I felt good about it. Yeah. And it maybe that helped create what it is that, that the disease that I have now to where I, I seek the small win and then move from there. Right. And, and it, it empowers me. So anyway, I, I'm babbling and I'm going on, but. And then fast forward, you land, you're basically, you're on network television for years. Yeah. Perfecting yeah. the craft that you're talking about spray bombing in your driveway. Well, for sure, and hammering out metal, <laughs> fixing dents. Yeah. So how that happened was out of necessity for me. I started a company, I've got good enough at my craft so I had another career in the music business and it was all eggs, one basket. And I was a singer and that was what was going to happen. That was a way for me to get out of the crappy little small town that I grew up in and away from all the things I was running away from as a kid and trying to get behind me. And I got to travel, got to go on the road, got to do that. I got to live as a working musician for 10 years of my life. I was essentially homeless for that period of time. And all eggs, one basket. And I wanted to be 
a rock singer, man. I wanted to be Robert Plant and Van Halen, all these guys. And, and you know, you get close. You work hard enough and you mm -hmm. get close. And we got close and uh, some almosts and all that kind of stuff. And then I blew my voice out. Mm. So I got to work in between bands at, at some shops in California and Miami and places like that all when I was traveling. But So I got a little bit of training, but for the most part, I didn't have anything else and it crushed me man it was <laughs> devastating yeah. I had nothing and um, I was married at the time and I had zero to bring my family so what are we going to do now because mm -hmm. it was over this yeah. gone yeah. it was over I couldn't order through a drive through without my voice breaking and it was done and I had no money to go to an ENT and figure out what what was going on so anyway so not to bog down in that garbage but but I had to get a job, and I knew body shop stuff, and mm -hmm. my dad was a paint and body guy. So I got a job at a body shop, in a local body shop. <laughs> I had jet black hair down to about here with a purple streak in it, pants <laughs> that were skinny leg pants and Capizio dance shoes, and I'm in Pulaski, Tennessee, looking for a job in a body shop. One of these things is not like the others, yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah. Gerald Martin uh, decided he had a guy quit, and it was just timing. So yeah. he hired me, and I was sweeping floors and stuff, and and he gave me a shot at working in his shop, which is a shop behind his house, and he and his wife drove, drove school buses. So, um, you know, he was a struggling entrepreneur as well. So, you know, and I worked my butt off for him, and I got trained and I got certified. So that gave me power. That gave me actually a sense of, if I work hard at this, it's gonna pay me back. Mm -hmm. And the music business is not like that. You can work as hard as you want, and be as good as you want, and, and be as pretty as you have to be, and all that kind of stuff, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't yeah, matter, yeah. you know, your success is dependent on somebody else. Right. So right. Um, anyway, it was, a, and when I think back on it, it was really a blessing that I didn't have success in the music business, because the shelf life of that is very short, right. especially in popular music oh, that absolutely. we're on the radio. Yeah, yeah. So when I figured out that I could do better for my family, get a paycheck, I got, I got empowered, and, and the, the first certification class that I went to was at a GM dealership. I got a raise afterwards. Hmm. That's pretty spiffy. Yeah, remember the Lumina vans with the plastic sides? I, I, I wish I didn't, but <laughs> no, yes, I do. Yeah, for sure. So it was a class in a clinic on how to fix those SMC composite panels. So mm -hmm. I got a little plaque certificate. The body shop that I was at got grandfathered into the dealer program. They got referrals, and I yeah. got a raise. So it was like, okay, this is how this works. Bam. I got every certification I get. So anyway, down the road a little bit, I'm better at my trade. I'm better at being a body guy. And... I, I was, you know who Craig Frazier is, right? Mm -hmm. Craig, yep. amazing airbrush artist and this amazing artisan. And, and he could show you, he had all kinds of videos. And I thought, wow, look at that. Look what he's doing. John mm -hmm. Kosmoski, House of Color, he had videos. And sharing I thought, his talent. Sharing yep. his talent. Yep. Those guys were starting from here. And this is where they're at, their custom painting videos. Right. Nobody was down here showing you how to sand the fender. Right. So the, the wheels started turning, and I thought, maybe if I did that, you know, I'm good enough to do that. I know enough to do fundamentals. So mm -hmm. anyway, so how did I get on network television? I produced an instructional video on how to paint a car. Guess what it was called? Paint your own car. Clever. <laughs> <laughs> so Slept on that one. Yeah, I did that. Mm -hmm. and, and struggled with marketing for forever, and, and I couldn't figure out where to sell it. I was trying to sell it in uh, jobber stores. Yeah. Um, in on tool trucks and I figured out really quickly well in about a year that I couldn't sell a fundamentals video to a professional market so mm. I was like what can I do I stumbled on enthusiast markets and and I figured right. out my wheelhouse which is companies like Eastwood Summit Racing and those became huge distributors for me over the time yeah. so while I'm trying to market this and get the word out I'm on the internet and the webs and it was before YouTube and it was before all of this stuff and I had a forum paintucation.com yep, forum. Yeah, I and, remember those days, yeah. Yeah, and so I would go and offer free help in all the other forums and work my forum and all that kind of stuff. And it was grassroots marketing, one sale at a time. Yeah. Not enough, not good enough. And the full-time collision job was never gone. Yeah. That was there, and I'm working out of a spare bedroom. So I needed to advertise. I couldn't afford magazine advertisement. So I made deals with regional magazines where I would give them free tech articles, and they would give me vertical third column ads in the back of the book. I was going to say because you're, you, you have credit as being a publisher for years. Yeah. I've been a freelance journalist for a long time, since, 19, since 2000, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, literally. Mustangs, paid. trucks. Mustangs, trucks, uh, all that yeah, type of yeah, stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. and I've grown that into, I've authored two how-to books for motor books publishing and, and all that kind of stuff. But I had to. Yeah. I couldn't afford, just like I couldn't afford my first car, I couldn't afford to advertise my company. So I willed it into shape <laughs> by doing it for free. And, um, and incidentally, that's kind of what got me on TV is through the Eastwood Company, got in touch with Stacy David. You know Stacy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's a great guy. And, and I was brave enough to call him. And I, and I was actually brave enough to say, can I be on your show? And he said, no, but here's what we can do. If you want to do some paint work for me, I'll talk about your videos on the show. Ah, Boom. There you go. Absolutely. Victor, yeah. Yep, yep. You have no idea how many people told me I was crazy, that he was taking advantage of me, that he was, he was uh, getting free labor. You're stupid. You're, you're, but I saw the opportunity. Well, in a way, it's like proof's in the pudding. So let me just show you. Yeah. And then you'll believe yeah. my process or what I'm saying. Right? For sure, for yeah. sure. But people thought that Stacy was trying to just get a free paint job out of me. Mm, and yeah. it's like, you know, you shut the noise off and you just do the job. Yeah. And if I'm wrong, then I'm horribly wrong. And I know his story. It was not like that. And what showed me the power of television was the Saturday that he showed my videos on one of the shows. And he said, and by the way, he did a walk around of the, it was a blazer like a big, it was called Project Big Blaze, so there you go for, yeah. you know, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> yeah. But he did a walk around, he said, by the way, if, if you want to learn how to do a paint job like this, check out Kevin's videos on Eastwood. That yeah. was on Saturday. Monday morning, the buyers called me and they said, I don't know what you did, but keep on doing it. We're sold out, we, and they reordered, not in tens and twenties, but in hundreds of wow. the copies. So That's it was awesome. like, yeah. well, and it taught me a huge lesson at, that mass exposure is important. Yeah. And, and so anyway, uh, that endeared me to the, the production company because I did more than one paint job for Stacy, And we were friends to this day. I will forever be grateful to him for doing that because he, had, he had, was the producer of the show and he had, uh, he had discretion over doing that. And he just decided that it was a cool thing to do, right? Yeah, right. And then fast forward to today, you're in charge of your own classes and your own education. You have your own thing going still today. You're, yeah. In fact, I'm... Hopefully scheduled to take one of your classes soon. Absolutely, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. 100%. I can get by. I can do a 20-footer, a 40-footer, a 50-footer, but like you were talking earlier, like you want to get better, you want to figure out how to hone this, and I've seen your paint jobs, your Camaro. What is that project called again? Uh, Zed Sled. Zed Sled. Because in Canada, where I grew up, Z was Z, right? Right. Yeah. That thing, I can't even explain. <laughs> It's not, it's not a glassy lake. It's more like a polished mirror. I was, do you remember how scared I was to get close? You didn't want to touch it. Like, Come on, man, there's more paint in the can. Let's go for a rip. I was like <laughs> 20 feet circle, just afraid. I mean, it was just incredible. Thank you. The body work on this car. And then it was like, I've got to figure out how to do this. And you have the answer. You have the classes. You have the, the videos and the DVDs and all that. Yeah. And it's not necessarily... Well, I'm sure it is in a sense, but I want to say you're taking years of experience and learning how not to do it in the wrong ways and the hard ways and condensing it and saying, here's your best opportunity to do it very good. Yeah. Just follow my advice, do what you can do. And one of the best tips that you gave me was, I called you, I don't know if you remember this, because I've been using the cheapest guns you can buy. Mm -hmm. Jungle website, Evil Bay, whatever. Yeah. I said, Kevin, what gun do I need to buy? And he said, the best gun you can buy is what your budget allows, period. Yeah. And I was, it was like, Pfft. just blew my mind. Because <laughs> you know, like, I thought you were going to say, oh, it's a SATA 84 billion gold uh. series. or <laughs> It's like, buy the best you can buy and learn how to use the gun. And, yeah. And it was just like, wow, yeah. that's, that's incredible. You know? now, I have my favorite guns. I, I, I use unashamedly soda spray equipment. I love the company. I love their philosophy. I love what they offer. But I completely understand, because I was there once, that I could not afford the top shelf mm -hmm. equipment. So you understand the function of the equipment first. What taught me how to be an instructor and how to answer the same question with enthusiasm a hundred thousand times is honestly writing tech articles. All those tech articles and my own instructional videos. Because you can't have a 17-hour video. Right. It's a 200-hour paint job. You can't be linear. It can't be right, like that. Right. It's got to be a 45-minute a video. So how do you tell that story in 45 minutes? Yep. It taught me how to refine the lesson. 
And magazines and writing taught me how to refine the lesson. And you know what really did was television. So we have 22 and a half minutes to tell a 100 hour story. How in the heck do you put the most important part out? Right. And we were how to, unashamedly how to, and I loved the format. We were talking a little bit before about Power Block. That was literally how to, how to television. And, you know, we got made fun of because, you know, it's like kind of corny and sort of formal and all that type of stuff. But, but for me, it was a pure form of let's get the best information out there that we can. Sure, we're selling parts. O'Reilly was a sponsor for a period of time, and all the other sponsors, and the Edelbrocks, and the Hollies, and all but that stuff. But that's what makes stuff. it happen. It's what makes it happen. Yeah. You've got to keep the lights on, right? Yeah. And you've got to have toys to play with. And if we're going to do an intake swap, we've got to have a manifold and a carburetor and a fuel right. line and yeah. all the filters and all that type of stuff. So you've got to have that. But what you do in between the hard parts is you try and empower. And I'll never forget it. Joe St. Lawrence owned the company. And he sat us down, and, and he said, we're not making TV shows here. We're not selling parts here, and we're not selling your personalities. These aren't your shows. These shows belong to the viewers. And what we're selling is inspiration and hope. Always keep that in mind. Huh. And so that was the mantra. It was like, yes, we're doing this, but here's something that I learned in, in the 15 years of, of, of doing this professionally yep. as a paint and body guy. Start with this grit sandpaper on your primers, blah, blah, blah. There was always the, t Joe called it the takeaway. Right. So that taught me how to focus on what's most important and what, you know, in a two and a half minute segment, if somebody's watching and their dog's trying to scratch out and get out the door and their wife's asking them for something, it's a Saturday morning, what did they get from that? If they can get a jewel and bring it home, then that's that. So that taught me how to be a more concise instructor, how to focus the message to what's really important. And yeah. it only took 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. You know, I've always, I've always liked watching you because one of my favorite episodes still today is when you fox team at an old 50, 52 yeah, to 54 Chevy or something. Yeah, it was a 49 something. or 51. Yeah, or whatever yeah. it was. Mm -hmm. But you were very just like direct and real. You were just, it was just, I don't know, brown. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, what is this? Black? Sure. Yep. Yeah. Stu over here, whatever. Yep. And it was like, this is my guy. Like, <laughs> he's just, he's very real direct, it's applicable, you feel like I could do this, you know, you just really are able to break things down and make them simple and not overwhelming. Because when you see the finished product, you're going, I can't do that. But when you see where you started, it's yeah. like, I might be able to pull this off. Well, with that truck, as a matter of fact, yes, you can do that. And so here's a back end story, uh, interesting story about that paint job. So when Duplicolor, paint manufacturer, right? Mostly shake and rattle cans. Mm -hmm. People have the misunderstanding that that's not good paint. There's no such thing as bad paint. There's only misunderstood paint, right? right. Yep. So Duplicolor paint, it's single pack, there's no hardener. You gotta treat it like that. Mm -hmm. The problem with, with Duplicolor paint is the people that are using it. It's it's uh, a paint that has to be applied in more than one coat. People make it's the mistake. It's the application process. Yes, yeah. they color with it. And yeah. now, you know, I mean, with your Craigslist rebuilds and your new bushings <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, I get it, man. It's, yeah. it's good stuff, and, and I, I love what it is that you do for sure. But when you want to get a real nice paint job on the air cleaner, there's a procedure that you have to go right. through. So the interesting challenge with that truck in particular was... We wanted to lower it and all that kind of stuff, and we put a split manifold on it and dual exhaust, and we did all the cool things mechanically, but how do we make it look like a 50s custom? And so we French the headlights and Cadillac taillights and all that kind of stuff, and then we're gonna do a patina paint job on it. Um, that wasn't even the plan. Duplicolor was, our contract for that year was two full paint jobs, incidentals, inc you know, paint support jobs, valve covers, things like that. Right. There was a certain amount of things that we had to do with that contract, that, that's the way the show worked. And they wanted a paint job on that truck. And I'm thinking, it's going to be difficult for me to get a slick and shiny paint job that you get from professional products with a Duplicolor product line. It took a, a, a few days of trying to think about how we're going to satisfy this contract. Because really, that's, that's the most important thing. We have to keep up the relationships right, between absolutely. and make them happy. And so you know, we bounced it off the marketing team. And they said, heck yeah, that sounds great we don't have patina paint on the shelf. I said, no, don't worry about that. I got this. <laughs> yeah. So um, I did a little bit of studying and came up with a recipe, which is using rollers, brushes, and, and spray cans. Yep. And you know, the first ground coat was black. 
Oh, I remember the roller. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah. I think I brushed the black on with yeah. a gnarly chip brush from Home Depot. And it was rough, and you're like, it was don't terrible. worry. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah. And, and then we going, took the what? roller, <laughs> made my own red oxide. Well, yeah. here's how to blend colors. You got a black and then an orange, and here's your red oxide. Yeah. We made red oxide primer because that was the color of primer and the nitrous tan putty from back in the day. Yeah, the front brushed, clips were all that red oxide. Brushed yeah. it on, and then came back and made it aqua color with two of their paint shop colors and just kind of blended it together and, and misted it over top of everything. So it already looked faded. And then when you sand through, the brush strokes come through and the roller marks come through and it gives the illusion. In my Uncle Herb's salvage yard when we grew up, back when we were little kids, faded out paint from cars from the 30s and 40s. I will never forget what that looks like. I've got these mental pictures of faded out paint. So I just drew from that and created that on that Chevy. So son, thanks for saying that. It was it's cool that you remember that one. Oh, 100%, it was probably yeah. the most fun I've ever had. We didn't even do it in a paint booth. I did it in the hallway between the studios. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's great because like this vanishing paint car back here, it yeah. makes me feel like somehow that's acceptable, right? And do you think maybe you had a hand in creating the patina world? Because really that was the first wow. big, that I can remember and recall, that was the first time that someone was recreating and saying it's okay to have patina. We want to make this look age. We want to make it look like it has character and you know, 50, 60, 70 years of wear. I don't know that anybody else did that. I don't know, man. I saw, I, I remember there was a, a magazine article. It was a fiberglass 39 Ford. And the guy had done a super detailed job of it. And there was rust holes and pit holes and just airbrushed rust coming down off oh, okay. the window channels. Yeah. So I'd seen it before. I know it had been done before. But I'd never seen it on TV. Nobody ever showed me how to do but that's it. that's really advanced if you're airbrushing. Oh, yeah, it's crazy, yeah. 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 But yeah. your average guy can do what I did. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I, I don't want to take that credit because it's too big. But what I wanted to get across, the credit I will take, is that there's a wrong way to do patina as well. <laughs> the sun is up there. Yeah. You, if you get sun fade on your rocker panels down so, here. Something's wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The planet's about to invert and we're all done. Yeah. But, so let's do authentic patina. Right. Let's take advantage of, you know, where our arm's hanging out the window. What's a wear mark there? That was the takeaway for me is yeah. arm hang, yep. fender sunburn. The door handles are swing down on that truck. So let's yep. get some fingernail grab, you know? I mean, yeah. so to do authentic patina. If you're going to do it, sure. You want to do it cheap? Yeah. Or inexpensively? I don't want to say cheap. Let's do it inexpensively with Duplicolor, but let's do it authentically and have it look cool, which, which I'm so proud of the stuff we did on that show. And that, that one in particular, it was just such a fun build, man. And yeah. it really resonated. It was one of our most popular projects for sure, me and Ryan. Have you done any more kind of Fox Tina or Patina cars? I mean, obviously you're known for these mind-blowing paint jobs, but do you, have you done one recently or do you have any plans to do one recently? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to do another one. I almost yeah. did it on the Miata. Oh, that would have been kind of cool. It would have been cool, wouldn't yeah. it? But um, but it, it it had like a, a bad two stage paint job and the clear it had the mains. You know, the clear coat was coming off of. Can it. I can I interject really quick? Yes. Okay, so I go to Kevin's place and he says I got this Miata. <clears throat> I'm like, all right. It was in primer, I think. He's like, yeah, I'm gonna spend a few minutes to shoot some paint on this thing and be done with it. Whatever. And I'm like. Yeah, that's probably what I, I and for me, I'm thinking like international tractor paint red or just single stage, something, you know, whatever. I come back like two months later, something like something that. Something like that, yeah. And there is this beautiful glass red Miata, <laughs> like I, amazing. And I'm like, Kevin, this is a quick, just shoot. He's like, I haven't even sanded it, buffed it, <laughs> nothing. And I was like, all right, I need to leave. This is, <laughs> this is too nice. I have to give credit to a good friend of mine that helped me bodywork that car. His name is Jeremy Winters, and if he's watching this, um, I just want to say thank you. Jeremy, you bailed me out on that. So he's down in Atlanta. So okay. I was just overwhelmed and angsting to him. And he said, dude, he said, I've got a few weekends. Bring it down here. I'll bodywork it, get it into primer, and then you can have it, and you can scuff it and shoot it. I said, thank you, thank you. Well, sometimes we're blessed with good friends that will, that will 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the age old saying, 
Body work is 90% of a paint job, is that true? Oh, 100%, no, it's 99% of the paint job. Okay. I can teach you, if you never had a spray gun in your hand before, I can teach you how to use the function and the utility of that gun in 25 minutes. I've done it. My in-person classes that I do now with my con yep. consulting contract, people come in and they've never held pneumatic spray equipment in their life. The function of it is very simple. Yep. What's really, what makes a painter, instead of a paint gun owner, is the ability to make the decisions during the steps. Oh, you know, okay. so right. so those decisions are what uh, you know. How do you do your foundation? Do you do it properly? Is it straight? Is it flat? Are your panels aligned before you start doing your fillers? And then what to do with the primer? I'm a student of this industry, and I'm surrounded by people that are brilliant artisans of of this. So I'm constantly learning, and I'm constantly figuring stuff out, and, and diving down the rabbit holes of procedure, of new methods, of correcting paint from the top down. So it literally, truly is, I always say, this is my quote, spraying the paint is the reward that you get for all of the work that you did getting everything flat. Right, because no one likes doing body work, let's no, be honest. No, <laughs> but, You know, I, we, we were talking, we had a panel discussion at a big car show, and it was me and Chip Foose and Jesse Greening and Dave Kindig and Steve Mank, and we were talking about what it takes. Yeah. Those guys are on a level way up here. Yeah. And you're not talking about hundreds of hours for a paint job. We're talking about thousands of hours for a paint job. Charlie Hutton, guys like that Jeez. in that caliber. And so how do you justify that? It sets the bar so stinking high for the average guy wanting to get there. But that's, that's the world that they have helped create in this unbelievably high level of execution. Randy Borcherding is another brilliant painter. And they, they don't stop. They don't say that's good enough, ever, ever. So the way they get those, those beautiful, beautiful works of art that are rolling, and the art's not in the procedure. The art's in the perception and the concept and the design mm -hmm. and putting the color co to, together and all that kind of stuff. Even making new colors. That's the art. Is the, it's the vision and the design. The rest is procedure. I can't even imagine having a shop trying to figure out how to produce those kinds of vehicles <laughs> and make money <coughs> doing so. It's yeah. just absolutely yeah. mind-blowing to me. We were, <clears throat> we were a power block. Chip would come in and one of the, if you ever get a chance to meet Chip Foose, go and shake his hand. He will be the nicest guy in the world to you. He's, that's just how he's wired. And those are the heroes that I want to be like, you know, and, and I, you've probably met him and, and he's just so genuinely genuine. Kind of a funny story. He's doing stuff with Courtney. They're doing the interstitial stuff and he's, I think it was with Magnaflow or, or I can't remember uh, what business he was doing there, but he's in between takes. So he's got about an hour to blow. He bops into the truck studio. What's going on, guys? And it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, you know, we'd pass each other yeah. in the hallways. It's not like we weren't friends. But, but he said, what are we doing? I said, uh, and I thought, OK, so let's do the tour. In this project, we're doing this and this engine and that. He said, no, no. He said, I'm bored. I'm antsy. Put, me, put something in my hands. Yeah. And I think, well, with this one over here, we're just about to put exhaust in. He said, no, you don't understand. I'm about to go stir crazy. Put, put me to work. Yep. So it was like, OK. <laughs> so we ended up going to work on something. It was like, this is kind of a cool moment. And just the, one of the discussions that we had was he said something I'll never forget. He said, we're only as good as our customers allow us to be. Hmm. Okay. So from a professional perspective like that, how good can you be? Just imagine if you had 4,000 labor hours what kind of a paint job could you put on a car? Right. 4,000 labor hours. Right. That's months worth of work. You could put a stinking good paint job on it. But right. each one of those labor hours has to be built out. It has to be justified. You said it um, in one of, the, one of these interviews. You said there has to be an ROI. Yep. To go get the vehicle, drag it out of the field, bring it back home. Are we going to fix it enough to sell it? There has to be a return of that investment. Otherwise, right. it's a hobby, and it's not going to last very long. Right. Because you're going to lose your, your butt. Mm -hmm. So, so those shops have to be able to justify the outcome, and they have to find the, per, the right client to do that. That in itself is, is a real challenge in the industry. I mean, these years, the last couple of years, since 2020. Since COVID, really. I mean, it's Custom been, shops are booming. Yeah. Guys that I know are booked two, three years out. That's wild. Isn't that crazy? And that's the, with those high caliber paint jobs. So somebody somewhere has decided it's worth it, right? So you hinted music a little bit earlier, and I'm, I'm learning a little bit more about you. Obviously, <laughs> sorry about that. No, it was great. It was good. So I didn't know this. We were talking uh, 
telling about a story. A mutual friend of ours was like, Kevin was a big deal back in the day. He, <laughs> it, was, it was this thing. And I thought he was pulling my leg, and then you started talking about it. And we're going to circle back around that uh, in a minute. But I, I want to know, like, in the shop, when you're working today, what do you jam to? Like, what tunes do you have on the radio? And I know it's tough because, like, you can't play music during stand-ups or filming, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so yeah. it's just dead silent. But if you're doing a time lapse or you're just rocking or you're trying to smash something out, yeah. what's on the radio? Well, like on the work that happens between the shots? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we jam. Um, so what's on the radio? You know what? I gravitate towards any kind of music where people freaking mean it. Mm -hmm. where I can feel their angst, their passion, their happiness, their joy coming through that music. Whatever it is, I don't care. Good country. I was coming back from, from Atlanta area, mm -hmm. and I put Spotify on Chris Stapleton. I love that guy's voice. You know why? Because it sounds like he's about to freaking die on every song. And he's I got just, some soul. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I, I just feel his emotion. Yeah. And he's he's a blues-based singer. He's got those bends and that bluesy stuff. And yeah. technically, he sounds like somebody put a wire brush down his throat and rubbed it a couple of times. But he's a technically very accurate singer. His yeah. notes and the inflections and the runs that he does, yeah. precise. And I've seen him live. He does that live. So he's a really skilled singer. So I love him. But he was, it was crazy. He was doing duets with everybody. Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran, <laughs> people like that. It's Chris yeah. Stapleton. So yeah. I love, these days, I love Chris Stapleton. I love some of the modern hard rock. Um, Shinedown. I love Shinedown. They've been yeah. around for a while. That's uh, a very unique vocal yeah, artist as well. Yeah. For sure. He, yeah. he wails, and he's got good control. I saw him doing a singles act in a club in yeah. Middle Tennessee. He was just him and a guitar, and he did about a 20-minute medley of all these songs that tied together in, 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 in E minor. It was, it was holy smokes. And so that's, he's, a true, he's a true artist. Yeah. Uh, Papa Roach, I love them. There's a, there's a real heavy group called Atreyu. I love Rob Zombie. So you're, uh, you're a rock guy. I am a rock through. guy. That's yeah. what I cut my teeth yeah. in. What changed my life, my Uncle Sigurd, he bought us, and he, he, I talked to him about it uh, this summer because we saw him. Um, I, I thanked him again. He bought us the first Boston album, right? Queen, A Night at the Opera, mm -hmm. with you know all those great songs on it. Led Zeppelin II. This is when vocals were really, I mean, you still had very um, artistic guitar tracks and yeah. leads, but vocals were really starting to take precedence. Yeah, for right? sure, yeah. and the, 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 whole, the whole thing about the front man, the front man, yeah. Robert Plant, you know, yeah. and Ian Gillen from Deep Purple. Those singers, because they just poured their hearts into the music and out through the microphone, and, and it's a full body expression. And that's what ended up, because I can play different instruments too. I started out playing bass, yeah. and then nobody wanted to sing. So I said, well, sure, I'll sing. I'll sing while I'm playing bass. Well, there's a, we got another bass player. Why don't you be the, you know, anyway, yeah. so that's how that happened, is because I, I basically came out of my, into a comfort zone doing it enough yeah. and figuring out that it was something that I could do okay. And then there's the, the gratification of that. You, the egotistical rewards for that. And let's face it, I've been trying for a performance career my entire life. I'm unafraid. It doesn't matter if there's cameras here. I'm not going to be any different. Right. You know, it's, yeah. But I've, I've wanted that type of a career for a long time because of the escape that I thought it would give me when I was a little kid. Right. So, you know, all our, our musical heroes... But yeah, a lot of them are hard rock. Um, and it's because, like I said, that passion comes through that. But Placido Domingo, Luciano Pavarotti, Beverly Sills, these opera singers that make you, they, you don't even know why. They're speaking in some other language, but the hair but stands you up on it. your arms and yep. you can feel it, yep. man. And yep. I don't care if you're a fan of opera or not, there are arias that will make you cry. Yep. And, and, and that is the, the prerequisite for music. Now these days, you know, I understand music production. I started, the first record I cut, I was 15 years old. It was, oh, see, it was the, terrible. We're learning stuff. Yeah. Well, but we're learning stuff here, all right. No, for sure, but, but we, we, we gigged, and it was a yeah. high school band that we had. We gigged, we saved up our money, and the guitar player and drummer's parents, they kicked in a bunch of money. We went and did this record, and it was so great, and it was overwhelming, and it was scary, and it was all these things, but we got to be in a recording studio. Yep. And the engineer and the other studio guy that, that helped us set up, they were so kind to us, we didn't even realize it because after the sessions they would put on groups like Tower of Power, Jazz Fusion Group, a live Tower of Power album and you got to 
stuff that blew our minds. You mm -hmm. know, gourds were exploded because we didn't know music like that could be made by people. And so it was this great learning curve and it taught me how to be humble about it because there's always gonna be somebody better than you. There's always gonna be somebody cuter than you. There's always gonna be somebody smarter than you. So you better be good at what you are. Yeah. And so that was what, you know, what propelled me in the music industry is I can be the best me that I can be and I can pull licks from Robert Plant and from all these other guys and Ian Gillen and, and all, all my heroes and I can try and be a composite of those singers that I love, right? That's pretty cool. Until I blew it away. <laughs> <laughs> Until I fried my throat. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, that happens. Uh, it, well, it but, did. But it was, what a blessing you took the course you did, though, in yeah. a way, right? Well, it is, 100%. Right. And, and if I hadn't had that catastrophic failure, and it was catastrophic. My ego was stripped. I was devastated. I, it, I was shaken to the core because everything I had planned for was gone. So now, what do we do? So it, it caused me to completely rebuild myself yeah. in a very humble Way. Was the haircut the first thing? Oh, no. That's they, probably pretty hard. So here's the story for the haircut. Um, I was a walk-on guest on the DIY network. Mark Lambert had a show called Classic Car Restoration, and they, I was a walk-on guest talking about paint correction. And I had my ponytail and all that kind of stuff, and in my first instructional videos, if you guys remember the first paint education videos, I had a ponytail, and uh, it, it looked like a mullet. <laughs> uh, but I called it all right. Ponytail. Anyway, yeah, acceptable. I like it. Yeah. And I go to DIY and do that and all that kind of stuff. Have my ponytail, all that kind of because that's my thing. I'm thinking that's my image, right? So yeah. I'm the ponytail guy. And um, they said we're casting a new show. Would you be interested in a screen test? And I said yes, I would. So went up to Knoxville, which is where we were shooting, and they called me and they said, "Great, your screen test is at three and your haircut's at one." <laughs> so they they well. Wait a minute. So they wanted you to slice before you even auditioned? No guarantees. I called my wife and I said, Judy, they want me to cut my hair to do the screen test. She said, well, is it going to guarantee you get the gig? And I said, no. I thought it was the other way at first. I was like, well, they're just basically telling you you're in. But no, no. Oh, what a no. risk. There was about what eight, eight people that did a screen test. And yeah. then they had the focus groups and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I said, you know what? No risk, no reward. So I cut my ponytail, or I cut. I was so rattled by that, Derek. It was amazing. I had to go in like a retail store with a mirror and then walk past and, and see what I looked like <laughs> with no hair because it was weird. It, I was nauseous. I got lightheaded in the barber's chair. And, um, and anyway, so go in there. I had my ponytail, did the audition, all that kind of stuff. Go home. I had a little dachshund, long-haired miniature dachshund. Had her for, she, she lived 17 years. She was my sweetheart. And I came home, and she, but she would punish me when I got home. <laughs> she would come up, hi, how you doing? Yeah. And then it's like, okay, screw you. I'm going over here. I'm going to ignore you, not you for a little while. Anyway, yeah. so she would punish me. So I set my ponytail down on the coffee table, and me and Judy go and talk. And here comes Daisy ripping around the corner with my ponytail in her mouth, stopped and just shredded it. Because I was going to do a locks for love or, or some, frame it or something like well, that. Well, she was mad. You cut your hair. She was mad. I cut my hair. Then yeah. she didn't recognize me when I walked in the house. Anyway, so that was the end of the long hair. And I ended up getting the gig. I got the TV show. My show is called Classic Rides. Yeah. And we did iconic vehicles. We did a, a Harley Electric Ride, a, Electric Glide, 65, a first year with the Electric Start. Also had the Kickstart, iconic, pivotal time in Harley Davidson history. Yeah. Um, did an Airstream trailer. I was so bummed out that we did an Airstream, because I wanted to do a street rod or a Mustang or something like that, a classic ride for me. And it was Airstream trailer. What do you mean? I was so sad. But then I got to learn the history of Airstream. And it's an entrepreneur named Wally Byam. Do you know that story at all? No, I this don't. This guy actually. was a no. sheep farmer. His family farmed sheep. And he would go out on the hillside and they would camp. And he made like basically a covered wagon with all these little compartments and a little thing for your books and something for your flashlight. And, and that was what he did when he was a kid. And so when he became a, a entrepreneur, he took that concept and made it into a travel trailer. I had no idea, that's no. crazy. And he was, I don't know if he was an aircraft mechanic, maybe he served in the war, but he took aircraft fuselage design and put it into a travel trailer. Literally, when you get down to the space frame of an Airstream, it's an aircraft fuselage. His first one might have been like a 727 or yeah, something. I don't know, maybe he just borrowed Put some caps on. And but <laughs> learning that history, it was fascinating, and I understood why they chose that vehicle. And it was kind of cool. It was not my automotive world. And I got to do, 
you know, PEX piping and some Hunter Douglas shades and make it look good and cork floors and all that kind of stuff. All the yeah. things that, that uh, Scripps and DIY and HGTV right. brought in, all the sponsors that they had. And it was a really cool experience. And then we did a Vespa scooter and I went, dang it. <laughs> but believe it or not, there's a gang of Vespas out in California. These guys, you do not mess with them. When they come around, they, these are hardcore tattooed up Vespa monsters. Hold on. Yeah, Vespa gang. The, I'm not kidding. The writing of Vespa. <laughs> does not connotate badassery, <laughs> does it? Okay. All yeah. right. So all you have to do is outrun them, basically, and then you're good. Yeah, but they, you know, they take that little engine and they stroke it and bore it. And, and, okay. All and, right. and I can respect that. Pull the front sure. wheel. So yeah. it, again, it was this immersion into culture that I had no idea existed. And it, you know, it cracks your mind open. That's a Tim Strange say, saying. It cracks your mind open. It allows you to think about something that you never normally would in your own silo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's pretty wild. So when we talk about projects here, you've, obviously you've had so many projects over the years, and uh, so have I. And I find it extremely difficult, and I want to ask you, is there one that really sticks out? Like, at the end of the day, everything washes away. This is the one project that I want to keep or finish. Mm. What is that for you? Like, what's the one thing that's like, that's Kevin, that's me, that's my persona, I need to finish it, it's my legacy, or, or it is my legacy because it's done, but that one thing. It's a hard question. It's a hard question because the, these cars mean different things to us. I did a first-gen Mustang and did a pro-touring version of it with a Schwartz chassis and the 04 Cobra drivetrain and interior. It was a great little car. My first car that I displayed at SEMA that I built. And, I, and it was just a super important thing for me and a, a notch on the, the, the bedpost of life. And it was really, really cool to have that. And it just about killed me to do that. And it almost hurt my marriage putting the time into it. And mm -hmm. I've never said that out loud. And, and, um, and she wasn't wrong mm -hmm. because I was spending so much time away from what I should have been Fully focusing Fully absorbed, on. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I was full time with Trucks TV while I was building that car. And I was full time with Paint Education while I was building that car and trying to help my wife with her small business and keep a household and keep, keep relationships while I was trying to do 5,000 hours worth of work in a two and a half month, you know, the SEMA thrash is real, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so that car, although I wish I would have kept it because it was so dang fun to drive. It was a lot of power and it sounded great. Um, there's, there's enough baggage on that thing to where I think sometimes, oh, I wish I had it back. And then I think, oh man, no, there's Don't associations, see it again. there's, there's yeah. warts and scars. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and, and my dad, one of my earliest memories was him peeling out of our driveway when I was three and a half or four years old in a first gen Mustang and he dumped the clutch and, and spun the tires in this little orange first gen. And, and, and so it, that sticks in you as well. But, and there's a truck that I've got that was my wife's dad's truck that he bought brand new. Is that 66? The C10? Six, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so that's super important to me. Yeah. And you know, he left that to me when he passed and, and I want to respect that truck and not, not bring it back fully original. I want to do my things to it, but not change it to where I, we don't remember anymore. Right. So yeah. that's super important. And it keeps on getting just pushed to the back of the bus. Um, I've got another second gen Camaro. There, you know, <laughs> there's, it's a 74, it's a weird, you might know this car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I want to do, I've been talking with AMD, they've got these conversion kits. Is it solid enough to do something? I think it is. Yes. I think it is. Yes. So it's got the right back glass too, right? Yep. So I want yep. to do the split bumper it's conversion. It's an AC on the car. Thing. It's, it's an AC a, car, it's got yep. the full interior. Yep. And so I want to do that. I think if I can get that one done, that's going to be the one that I want to hang on to. But I have to say... That's cool. I it, like that. No, I love it too. And I wanted to talk to you about yeah. it too because, because um, just, you know, not just to get your blessing on it, but, um, but just to kind of bang some ideas around, right? There's, it, there's a backstory here. I traded yeah. Kevin <laughs> the 74 Camaro that I got because I pulled the drivetrain out of it. The body for me was too... I couldn't... I looked at it and went... Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Kevin walks up and goes, oh my gosh. This thing is great. It's so like, solid. Yeah, I, I just need this, this, that, and this. And I'm like, yes. And you traded me a, a Mustang engine yep. transmission. Inline six out of uh, that 67. Accessories, a four-speed shifter, some parts that I needed for my Mustang. Yeah, so and we you just, scabbed parts off of that. So yeah, it was this cool trade It's just a swap. Yeah. Do the thing. And 
I'm glad that you're using it though, because there's so many people that would take like the front seats and the AC out of it and just scrap well, it. Well, full disclosure, I've got a 76 Rally Sport on jack stands right beside it, and the front end's gone. And I wanted that front end for that for my 76. Yeah. And I didn't have a dash, I didn't have seat frames, all that kind of stuff. So I was just gonna part out everything from the 74, but I started looking at it, I got underneath it. The frame rails are good yeah. in that thing. The, the floors are nice. I yeah. know, yeah. I know. So all of those things that make a second gen worth saving are there 100%. Now the roof, that's a whole other story, Swiss cheese. Oh, it's terrible. No, it was a vinyl top car and that's what happens, right? But you could take the roof from the other and swap it over. Or I can get a brand new skin from AMD. This is true. You know? Yeah. Um, a buddy of mine's got one sitting on a shelf he never used for a project. It's out in Texas. i got to figure out how to get it back here. But yeah. so all of that, that's just problem solving. Yeah. That I see the problem. I know what the solution is. Bam. The rest of it is, you know, what are we going to do with it? Yeah. Do you, have you ever had a project? I know I've had many in my life. You see a lot of them on the lifts back here where you have the full ambition, you have the technology, you have the product or pieces, you may even have the time, but you just don't have the ambition or gusto to be like, I'm ready to jump into this thing. Do you have any projects that are just sitting, other than like the C10, Yeah. you know, is there, is there something that you want to build that you're like, I, I need to do this, but I just, I'm not ready. I don't have the time. Yeah, yeah. I had a 1957 F100 in high school. Now the 57 is the one year only single headlight front end. Um, you still have this? No. Oh, okay. You no. want to make another one? I want to do another one. Okay. Yep. And, you know, they had, uh, my, my truck had um, a small back window. They make a big back window cab, which is just so much prettier. Yep. Um, with a step side bed, and it looks all cool. And, and I had one in high school, and I've got so many regrets because I just treated it poorly. And I had no idea what I was doing. And it ended up sitting, rotting, and I want that truck. I want to do that truck. I want to do it justice. I want to do, I want to do the Crown Vic front end on those. That F100s. would be sweet. And that would be cool. The Thunderbird IRS guys okay. are doing those yep. swaps, right? Because yep. it's it's on a level plane. The geometry is within the suspension itself. You set it level and you weld it in, and now you've got IRS on a, on an F100. Crazy great. And like the Crown Vic swap, the whole chassis swap, the guys on Roadkill did it. Sure, it's a great idea. Yep. But that giant axle arch, you lose your bed floor. Right. With the IRS out of it. You a, don't. A, no, you yeah. don't. Yeah. So I want that truck and I want to do those custom tweaks. And I might do another patina paint job on it. And but th so that's one of the ones that I'm going, yeah, well, I want to do that. And then I see the reality of what it is that I've <laughs> the tasks yeah, that I've yeah. set ahead of myself yeah. and the workload that I've yeah. created. You know, why do we do that, Derek? Why yeah. why do we create this insurmountable mountain of crap that we have to climb through? I, I think it's just like when you're when you truly love doing what we do, you always put something on a pedestal yeah. because you're trying to find an excuse to always work, Yeah. right? I, that's how I look at it. It's like, yeah. if, if the sun's up, I'm working. If the sun still rises, God willing, yeah. I, I have to do something. I get sad when the days get shorter because I don't have as much time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So always having that, well, someday I'm gonna go do this, but I am personally starting to realize there's some projects I probably am just not Going to get to, so, honestly. Interesting. My buddy TC is okay if I drop names. Yeah, because these care. are yeah. these are my, yeah. my my very good friends, and they're yeah. people that I truly respect. But my buddy TC Pennick, he's got Bay One Customs in Springfield. He's one of my guys, one of my guys that comes down when I'm in a thrash, and he's brilliant. He's a self-taught engineer, and um, we can talk about what that means later. But but um, he's a really great, talented builder, and we were talking. It was last year we were talking, and he's a one-man show, too. He works by himself. He's got people to come in and help him, but, but we have a lot in common in that respect. But he's a, he's a car builder. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, you know what? He said, you know, we're, we're not 25 years old anymore. And he said, i, I got to think about this because, you know, it takes me two years to build a car. And I've thought about it. I did the math. I've got five builds left. Before you can really enjoy it? No, and just no before he's gone. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it was morbid, man. He timed it out like that. He said, I've yeah. got about five of these left before I probably can't do it anymore. You got to put your mark in there Not somewhere. everybody can be Gene Winfield. Yeah. You know, he's an amazing human being and he's an amazing artisan and, and I hope he, he's here for another 10. He's 95 years old. 
how many panels can we hammer or chops or tops can we chop when right. we're 95? Well, ask him. He's doing it like like six a year. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> he just did so, it last week. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's unusual and it's, and it's uncommon. So yeah. not not to get all like heavy about it, but where do we really want to spend our time and right. what do we want to build what is really going to mean something and what is going to fulfill us right mm -hmm. you were grown you know we got a little salt and pepper right yeah. here yeah. and and what is going to mean the most to us and to us i mean me and my wife that's my family so yeah. what is going to help us grow and help us do something that we can maybe slow down a little bit and do something do some traveling or whatever so for me um it's, it's, it's creating something that is going to live past me. And that is my training programs. So That's your legacy. It, it's my legacy. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's really kind of neat yeah. to talk about that I might actually have a legacy. You well, know? I think you absolutely do. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But I'm working on it, man. I'm working hard on it. <laughs> well, I think that, <laughs> that definitely shows. And I think myself and all the fans absolutely appreciate the hours you put into it. And I think it oozes with all the projects that you do, how talented you are and how much you care. Dude, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're moving on to the fan favorite segment, which Dulcich helped me understand how that worked, called Help Me Understand, which is where fans write in and they're looking for advice or tips or tricks or just ways to, well, help them understand what they have going on. I'm not used to this. We were just talking about this. Normally we have things on cinder blocks and railroad ties and front clips missing and engine parts everywhere. Look at this beautiful 32 Roadster. Wow, no, that's nice. It's very nice. The hairpins, and look at the glint of the sun off the paint. That's a nice paint yeah, job. That's what, that's what Kevin brings to the show. So <laughs> this thing scares me. So he says here he's got a, a very mild 350, so I'm guessing probably just a 350 with Crate a cam or something, and yeah. a, a intake or something, yeah. yeah. And uh, he converted it to a Holly Sniper EFI from a carbon tater. And the difference was great. It's running great. But recently, it's developed a random issue where the car will just shut off like you turn the key off. The vehicle has, to this point, always been restarted with no problem as to when it happens. But it happens randomly. Any suggestions where to start looking for the issue help me understand what's going on? So do you have a lot of sniper experience? You know, the experience I have with all the EFI stuff is they really don't like electronic interference. You have to mm -hmm. isolate that computer yep. away from all of that stuff. The other thing is that the, the fuel pumps are very sensitive to voltage fluctuations. So a loose ground, that'll, that'll you know, it devastate your fuel system. And then the, it, cars don't run if the fuel pump isn't running. So my first thought would be to, to, to ohm out the electrical circuit in his fuel pump delivery chain. Absolutely. And, yep. and, and that would be my first thing to eliminate. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely going to be electrical. One of the things I learned the hard way is um, your positive and your negative need to go directly to the battery. Yeah. And uh, just just check, like, even like your 12-volt your, your, uh, keyed ignition source, is that janky? Is your key tumbler getting worn? Is the rack and the column getting worn? There's something that's interrupting either ground or power to that computer, especially if you could just restart it. Yeah. It's not, well, a, it's not a constant. And here's the other thing. You've got a computer in a 75-year-old car with a 50-year-old engine. Mm -hmm. You're cross-pollinating eras. So you, you can't expect, like in all these... 60s cars that you go and rescue, you know, they've got that resistor wire that brings yep. 12 volts down to 6 volts or 5 and 9 volts or some crazy thing. Um, people kind of, you know, there's like Pertronics ignition, they will bypass that and get you full 12 when you turn the key on. Yep. I've had to learn these things the hard way when this stuff just doesn't work properly and you're scratching your head and your butt at the same time. And, you know, it's so hard to remember that we can't cross pollinate generations of vehicles. <laughs> yeah. You know, it doesn't without work. Without like issue. That. Not without yeah. issues. Yeah. And, and it's going, yeah. you're going to have some Easter eggs that you got to find. Yeah, for sure. I would just check your grounds, uh, check your 12 volt constant, check your 12 volt key switch. Beautiful car. Good luck with it. Yeah. Those look like, um, were they called hipsters or hopsters? Ooh, those are, yeah. Um, it's like an like early the, 2000s. The, the kidney bean type yeah. of a, yeah, with the spinners. That looks great. I considered those for a Chevelle. Beautiful car, though. Very beautiful. The next one is Kevin L. 
And he's got a 58 Edsel with a 475. This is before, no. oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Back when fuel mileage. I just discovered did it quite... the redeeming thing about Edsel's. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, yeah. no offense. Edsel is 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 iconic. It is it's an yeah. important car. We'll say it's unique. Yeah. So they had the reverse flip hood like the Thunderbirds. It had a nice cab, beautiful sail panel, questionable front end, awesome power plants. Yeah. And uh, he said it's been sitting for 30 years. He's watched Vice Grip videos all the time, and he's getting excited to do a will it run on the Edsel. He was able to pull one spark plug, but all the other ones are stuck. What is the best way to get them unstuck? Help me understand. Boy, heat? I'm going to say heat. Heat and juice? He, heat. Here's what I would try first. I would get some WD or some Marvel's Mystery Oil, something like that, and soak down those, those, those thread bosses where the, the, the plugs thread into the cylinder head. I'd try that first. Then let's get the hot wrench. Let's yeah. heat up. The, the, heat the up. plugs are done anyways, right? Right. So an amazing thing happens with expansion and contraction of metal when you get a threaded surface. They almost work themselves out, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah, I, th I agree completely. I can't believe I'm answer answering questions ahead of you. <laughs> no, I'm I pretending don't. I'm Derek Bieri <laughs> right here. I, I know nothing about this. I'm a Lego no, box engine builder. You are an you actual got it. mechanic. No, so. that's exactly what I do. Try some juice. If that doesn't work, juice and heat. And then just, you gotta close your eyes and just give her at some point, <laughs> right? Get, if you can't get it unloosened with a ratchet that long, then you get the chrome molly tube steel in the breaker bar. Yeah, I mean, some people don't have that, so just pull the corner post out on your fence yeah. and just put that on and just, yeah. you know, laying on it. Mm -hmm. And if that strips. Piece of exhaust tube. Yeah, anything you can find. Yeah. He's, he's got a very beautiful shop, so he's got stuff laying around here. Look at this thing. It's all tanned. Yeah. It's got He's lifts. so organized. Yeah. He should come to my house. <laughs> Help me <laughs> clean my shop. It's actually pretty embarrassing. <clears throat> Don't show that picture very long. Okay. Next one is Mike R. Uh, this is a question for Kevin. What was the best part of working on a television show? Was it the sponsors or the unlimited budget? Hmm. That's a tough question. Multi-layered. So, yeah. The unlimited budget is a bit of a misnomer. We, we were so fortunate and privileged to be able to work with manufacturers' parts without having to buy them. That said, I understand, because I build my own cars without sponsored parts, I understand what it takes and what kind of a sacrifice mm -hmm. it takes to, to build a car out of your own wallet. So I will never not be grateful for the experience of being able to use really expensive stuff for the sake of doing cool things, right, you know? Yeah. And so it was the ultimate toy box to play in. But, you know, and, and the sponsors, um, you know, of course you're gonna deal with sponsors. The best thing I got out of working with sponsors was learning marketing. Yeah, absolutely. When the marketing team yeah, comes in for yeah. X company, is, you know, what is your marketing message? What are you trying to do? What's the benefit? Why is this version better than the last version? So it was a, a crash course in me understanding the automotive aftermarket. But I tell you what, the absolute best thing, and this is, this is for the, the viewer as well, the best thing that I got out of the whole experience was understanding that it's not about parts. It's not about winning races. It's not about satisfying contracts. This whole industry is about relationships. Mm -hmm. And friends that I made in the very early days of TV are friends of mine to this day. And the people that shouldn't be in your life get weeded out very quickly. And those hardcore relationships, they stick around. You know this. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, and, and the people... <sighs> I've always said it's a big world, but it's a small industry. And the people that matter, the people that really show themselves to you, the relationships and the bonds that you build with all of these manufacturers, um, that, that sticks with you for a lifetime. So that was the most valuable thing. That was the best thing out of doing all the TV stuff for all of those years, is the people that you get to know. We spend more time at work especially with a TV schedule like we had, than, at home. than we do at home. Yep, 100%. And, yep. and if, if you can't get some sort of a, if you can't get more fulfillment than the paycheck out of that, then maybe you should change vocations, oh, you know? That's incredible, yep. So it's not necessarily tangible or physical, it's more mental or just 
learning you've got yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, learning and then, you know, knowing that you've got a guy that you've known for 10 or 15 years, you can call him and, and say, hey, how you doing? Right. Or, or see him at a trade show or a car show and, and shake hands. Right. And something, i got to be careful to dance around this, but something a lot of people at home don't realize is we don't necessarily want to th spray the parts gun on a project, but those are the things necessary yeah. to keep the heat and the AC and the lights and the staff. I'll never and, apologize for that. I mean, this yeah. just, you, you have to do that to march forward. Yeah, and you get the emails and we get the stuff. We just get the feedback on the shows. Oh, it must be nice to have blah, blah, blah. You got a monster transmission and you didn't have to be. Yes, it's nice. Let's get that out of the way. It's necessary to do what we have to do to find the takeaway. Right. Circle back to what Joe Saint told me. Find the takeaway. It, it's, it's not about the transmission or what comes in the box. It's about the people that build the transmission. Let's talk about, you know, you know yeah. there's, there's other things that are more important than getting free parts. And frankly, parts aren't free. If I'm doing a tech story, if I'm writing a magazine article, uh, I, you know, we're, we're doing a, I did a, a centrifugal supercharger on a square body truck a couple of years ago with a friend of mine. He got a free supercharger out of it. And I, I wrote the article. But there's work in it. There's work in it. There, it took us three weeks of filming to get that system on there. Yeah. So where does that labor come from? Any shop is going to be at least 50, 60 bucks an hour. Right. Three weeks of work at 60 bucks an hour. I could have bought that. <laughs> and then some. You know, and then yeah. some. And yeah. what I got paid to, to write the article, it's, it's not what people think, man. It's yeah. not what people think. It's like TV shows. They don't pay us what people think they pay us. Yeah. So we're, we're having to, to figure out different reasons. For me, writing tech articles these days is, is about keeping my hands in it, seeing where journalism is going, getting, you know, being abreast of the latest technology, keeping my senses sharp, and quite honestly, keeping my name out there. Right. You know, and, and yeah. keeping visible when there's still a, an avenue like a magazine to be visible in. Right, that's awesome. Well, that's a great answer, very detailed. Hope that helps you. Yeah, I hope so too. And, yeah. and you know, there's no magic bullet. Yeah. You know, free parts aren't free. They're not. They're, <laughs> there's two types of currency. There's money and there's time. And well, and time is nothing you can buy more of. No, right? I can get another job and make more money. I can get three jobs and make even more money. Uh, you find me somebody that can spin out some time, I want to meet that guy. <laughs> oh, you ain't kidding, you ain't kidding. All right, what's this in the box thing called? You're going first, right? Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Yes. Okay. You still, you still can't see. I right. cannot see. What in the? <laughs> okay. Why is it so hard? You're not doing this one. I know, but I feel bad for him. <laughs> you will get this Please one. tell me it's out of the packaging. Yes. It okay. is, right. but this is. No, I think you'll get it. This is going to be fun. Are we rolling? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's what I needed. All right. This is the Dorman Mystery Box. In here is an automotive part available at O'Reilly Auto Parts. We've unpackaged, stuffed in this box. There's two holes for your hands so you can reach in here and feel it. Yeah. I just want to see if you can guess what this is. By feel. By feel only. You're joking. No. And then, after you probably fail miserably, I'm going to do the same. Okay. <laughs> So right. if you're going to throw parts in, spin the box around, I'm going to do the same thing. All right. So good luck. This is, this is really... If this is a plate of spaghetti with grapes in it, I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> I wonder, can you get a tight of this thing? Because it's not... Right? It doesn't make sense. There's a multi-pin plug. You got a multi-pin plug. Okay. There's a... There's a mounting tab. We got mounting tabbage. So you know it's electronic at this point. What is this? Or is it? Oh. There was a light bulb just went off. I saw it. This is tough. I feel like it this- It is tough. This should have been the, are they worse than this going forward? Oh great. Oh, I know what this is. This is a in-dash radio module. Oh, ho, ho, ho. In dash radio, okay. Or, do or, I, do or, I pull it out? Or a heater control. Okay, he got it. That's I, a win. Is it? That's a, a win. Control? HVAC module. No. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> Dude, that, that was is, awesome. Uh, I, That's impressive. I would have had no idea. <laughs> wow. I would be like, Xbox controller? What are we looking at? What is this, too? Dodge or something? No, it's a Chevy. That is so <laughs> impressive. I was looking at it going, oh, I don't think I could get that. <sighs> Great. <laughs> Maybe a flex capacitor or something. <laughs> All right, put it on the table. There you go. Is there a time limit? Get comfortable, guys. It's going to be a while. <clears throat> what do you think, Kevin? I think it's not going to take you very long to ace this one. Really? You I look pretty confident. It's heavy. It is heavy. That's all what I'm going to say. What are you doing to me? It's like four pounds. Steel? No, pot metal. All right. What? What is this? It's a gear. Gear of some kind. It's not, it's not small block Chevy, Ford, Dodge. It's definitely not old. This is newer. What would these be? I'm trying to figure <laughs> out what it is too. I'm looking at it. <laughs> Why is it so big? I wanted to say it's like a, like a timing gear or something, but it's big. It's not that. This is newer. You put, did you put this in the box? Did Allison put it in the box? Then it's gonna be something newer and you guys are trying to bamboozle me. Allison is about dying. It's definitely her fault. Okay, so this, so let me think. Do all over it. This is a cam I sprocket. Think that's what it is. Cam 100 percent. Cam yep. sprocket. Yep. Yep. I thought it was. Yes. A, I thought it was a timing chain gear until you turned it around. I saw the spring and. Yes. I don't know what it's to. Good but... job, man. Wow. Sweet. It's what really is shiny. it for? Is it a Ford modular motor? Well, it's a Dorman 917 250 XD. 917 250 XD. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I hate it when you laugh like that. <laughs> oh, good luck. All right, I'm going to do... Right. Okay, so it's featherweight. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, you found it. There it is. This is a... Listen, this is pivotal. I know exactly what this is. This is the license plate light frame that goes in the rear bumper of a... I'm going to say Chevrolet truck. Am I wrong? <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I don't think it's a Chevrolet, but yes, that's what it is. It could be a Chevrolet. Maybe not. No, it's not round enough. This is the one that I picked that I was like, this is going to be really difficult. Like, if I had to do it, I wouldn't want to do you it. You know, it was the giveaway is these twist lock tabs. You, go, uh, you know where I failed? As I forgot that he's a career body man. And probably you felt all the fasteners. In and, the dark. Yes. Under the car. Dang it. <laughs> I've seen you countless times doing this, rebuilding a carburetor without looking at it. I have faith in you. <laughs> All right. It's heavier. It's got a jingle. Why? It's a bracketry thingy. That's not really technically descriptive. This doesn't go on a car, does it? This is like a motorcycle. This feels like a 10 millimeter. Is that a 10 millimeter? I'm being coached, I can't, I can't help. It is. <laughs> <laughs> is this going as expected? <laughs> okay, disassembling, continuing. I don't know what this is. It, it swings on a rod of some kind with a cable assortment. It's a lever doodabber machine. What's it, what's, what is it actually? Stop it. I would thought that you had, would be able to feel that one. I have never seen this in my life. What part number is this? <laughs> Was this in the store? How, where would this, 
where, I know where is I, that applicable? I know I could have used one of these a time or two. So now that I know that O'Reilly stocks them, <laughs> I know where to go get it. But it's okay, so it's like a jumper. Your, your hot or ground cable comes off, latches your battery, and you can come off with two different feeds. Oh, if you're into the boom booms and stuff. Probably. Or that, or yeah, or you need a direct battery power for your um, EFI. Well, it's the 926-882. Oh, there you go. What are, oh, okay, I know what this is. But, it, but this is a, can I give him a hint? If I'm stuck, then you can give me a hint. Maybe, maybe? Okay, thumbs up from. Well, you're a musician. You're used to woodwind instruments. There's your hand. It's a car part, how could it be wood? <laughs> Good okay, luck. so it's heavy. Lord. Right. There's holes. <laughs> oh, this is so much more fun on this side. Okay. It, it's a very complicated version of something you felt on every engine you've ever worked on. Oh, okay, so I know what that thing is. And there's a little bulb on the end. What is this? Yeah, I don't know. That? That's another, oh. and there's another one. I know, they keep there's going. Things. Wow. Go inside the square hole in there. I think I saw this on the first Jurassic Park movie. Yes. And, and right? What is? I don't know what that is. I can't help you. <laughs> but it goes against something. And there's a flange on there, and it looks like there's a gasket surface right there or I, not. I could agree with you, maybe, yeah. All right, so what's your hint? I'm stuck. I gave you the hint. What was it? Woodwind intro? It's you felt a million of them, but it's an <sighs> overcomplicated version of something very simple. It transfers something. Is that too much? It's not a water pump, is it? No. No. <laughs> no. It's got to be something with fluids because these ends have holes in them that allow things to go through them. Um, it is, what is it? Something that... I don't even know what that... Can we say what a goat, what kind of car it goes to? What does this even go on? Is it a four-wheeler? I can't... Well, there's a mount. There's a screw hole right there for mounting. This should just be the whole show, I think. <laughs> This is gonna be go virus, <laughs> like the box open videos. This one's tough, I gotta, this one is really tough. Okay, I know coolant goes through it. Okay, maybe. Okay. <laughs> if it's not a water pump, what else does coolant go through? Okay, so it's a heater it, core distribution valve? Mm -hmm. No. It's not a radiator. Okay. It's not a water pump. It's power steering, it's... No, no. can I give more hints? I don't know. It goes through a ship. No. I'm, I'm, I'm dying I'm, on this I'm one. I'm embarrassed to say. I'm dying on this okay, one. Okay, so think of a 350 small block Chevy. Yeah, what year? Old, new? 1956 to okay. 1980. Over How does the coolant get to the radiator? Because it goes bottom oh. hose to the water pump. Is this a thermostat housing? Boom. Thank you for your clue, because, <laughs> yeah. Look at this thing. What in the world? <laughs> what See, is it's that? It's a woodwind, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is that noise? I don't like that face, Kevin. <laughs> is it flipping? Did, did you, you didn't see it, did you? No. Did it come out? It, yeah, it did. I had to put it back. Is this the whole thing? Yeah. I think I actually know what it is. Okay, this is gonna be on the dormant help aisle. You can find it in the back wall of your O'Reilly Auto Parts store. <laughs> but. See, what you're doing right now with your hand should give you a clue as to what it, what, well, it, it what I think it is. It spins, is. it yes. rotates. Yes. But I'm trying to feel if there's like a cable opening in here. It's got weird things on it. I can't even read that label. <laughs> okay, next, let's bring it down. Let's bring it down a little bit. That is not what I thought it was. <laughs> oh, great. That is not what I thought it was. <laughs> I have no help for you. 
<laughs> I have nothing to add. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know what we need to figure out is punishments if we can't get it. Right? Oh, yeah, like shots or something. Yeah. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> like you get three clues. Uh, like beer pong. If you don't get it, it's either a shot or like a paintball gun to the face or something. <laughs> something easy. You know? no. All right. I don't know. I give up. What is it? All right. So the description on the packaging is... Oh, it's a 926.99. Flexible steering coupler. Stop. This steers a car? You know what I thought it was? I thought it was a window lift motor gear. Whoop! Because sometimes they're plastic on plastic. Well, listen, we had two more parts left, but we're apparently not very good at not, this. No, sorry. Well, we, we gave our best. <laughs> it, it, was, it was fun. If you guys would like to see this more, you can actually email inisles9000 at gmail.com. Leave some feedback if you want to see it again. It's probably going to be crickets. But thanks for joining, <laughs> Kevin. Thanks for joining. This Absolutely. Was a blast, thanks for having as me. As usual. Yeah. Please subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so you get future shows just like this with awesome guests. Thanks, guys, for watching. Appreciate you very much. We'll see you next time. All right. Refill? Yeah. <laughs>